In this video, I hope to accomplish three basic things. One is that I want to give a brief overview of the history of France and England from the Norman Conquest in 1066 all the way until the end of the Hundred Years' War in 1453. The second and probably most important thing that I want to do is look at the concept and development of the national monarchy. Both France and England would come to exemplify this model of medieval government and this medieval style of government in turn would evolve into the modern nation state which is currently the dominant model of governance in the world and the other thing that I really want to look at because it looms large in any account of the Middle Ages is the Hundred Years War and to keep things connected the Hundred Years War of course is vital to the formation of the national monarchy because it really is during that war when the identities of the French and the English as two opposed things that are not compatible really emerged. So without any further yammering, let's get this started. I want to organize this video around three key themes and concepts. One is the concept of the national monarchy, which I've already mentioned and which I will explain more fully in the next slide. The second thing that I want to focus on is the formation of national identity. This one is the trickiest of all of these. Um, it's very hard to try to figure out exactly when and how people switch their um, identity politically. Um, you know, when they start to believe in a government that they're under and when they start to identify themselves as being in some way uh, members of it or part of this shared community. So this is something that is a fraught subject and hopefully you'll have at least a little bit of an understanding of how this works by the end of this video. And the third major theme here is the recurrent theme of the crown fighting the nobility for power and influence. We've seen that pretty much throughout the Middle Ages. This is a recurring conflict in pretty much every kingdom and region that we've examined, whether we're talking about the Byzantine Empire or we're talking about France and England in the late Middle Ages, we see that there's a constant struggle for power between the crown on the one hand and the nobles on the other. So let's now talk about the concept of the national monarchy in more detail. Previously we've looked at other types of states which emerged in the Middle Ages. We looked at the Republican city-states of Italy, we've looked at the Byzantine Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Kievan Rus, and the Tsardom of Russia. So now let's look at the national monarchies of Western Europe, namely England and France. Castile also counts as a national monarchy, but I decided not to look at that in the same kind of detail. Um, a national monarchy is a state which has a fixed capital like London or Paris. This then becomes a permanent center of governance and administration. So that means that um, these cities take on a greater importance than they otherwise would. Um, another characteristic is that you have sacral sites, cities and other areas which have a special significance for your people. So for England, Canterbury is sort of their spiritual center. This is where kings are crowned. This is where the archbishop of the country lives. And then Reims serves the same purpose for France. Um, so these sites are separable from the political capitals. And this also means that both of these areas have some sort of meaning attached that people living in that area understand and um, are affected by. We also see that there is a certain amount of ceremony um, around a monarchy. So there are certain ceremonies and rituals that accompany the monarchy. and So there are ways that people greet the kings, chants that they have, things like that. And that this forms a sort of religion. Um, and when you combine that with the coronations which take place at the sacral centers like Canterbury or Reims, this means that people feel like they're enacting a sort of um, ritual which links them back to their ancestors. So that old French saying of the king is dead long of the king, the idea is that you um, there's a continuation that 
um, your people and uh, are living on and that nothing has actually changed, that you're still the English and that there's still a king of the English. There's also an idea of um, a distinct sense of identity between the people in one area and the people in another. So, for instance, rather than seeing the people over one hill and the other hill as being the same if you live on a border, you see the people behind you as being your countrymen and then the people who are the same distance away from you in the other direction as being outsiders in some way. Um, that's an important characteristic of the national monarchy. And actually we have quite a bit of evidence that before these identities really got fixed, that people didn't really, um, you know, necessarily see outsiders as having separate identities necessarily. Um, again, though, our, our evidence when we talk about identity is pretty limited for any kind of uh, pre-modern period where we have such limited data and we have so little insight into the thoughts of the common person. There's also a notion that lands are distinctive. So, for instance, um, this is exemplified in the fact that the kings of both England and France were known as the kings of the English and the French until the late Middle Ages when they became the kings of England and France. And then England became a discernible thing that you could, like a physical, material thing you could point out on a map. And the same thing is true of France. France is now a distinct thing that exists on a map, as well as being the place where the French people live. Um, so between those um, transformations of identity and also these administrative um, and ceremonial developments, it's these things combined which create a national monarchy. So the histories of England and France during this period are tightly intertwined. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that by virtue of being the Dukes of Normandy, the kings of England were often vassals of the kings of France in at least one capacity, but not necessarily the other. So this is a fairly complex relationship, and due to this relationship, the two sides will often trade information and ideas on how to govern properly. So when the Normans overran England, they already had a system of administration in place which was different than that in the rest of France. They used what are known as bailiffs, who are officials reportable, who report directly to the Duke of Normandy. And then these officials are what allows the Duke to intervene all over the realm. And this administrative method was then expanded and imposed on conquered England. Um, William went on to reward all of his Norman followers and appease the existing Anglo-Saxon lords where he had to. And because these new Norman lords were outside conquerors and they had dispossessed a lot of Anglo-Saxons, they decided that they needed to fortify their positions in order to um, protect their power. And that's why England now has a bunch of castles on it. Because before, um, they were following the Alfred the Great model of national defense, and they relied more heavily on fortified towns and forts that were at key locales. But now England will become more feudal in the traditional sense, and uh, different lords will set up their own castles in order to impose themselves upon the locals, um, a system that was already in place in France. However, in England, the control will be a lot tighter, and the king would have a much better idea of what's going on in his realm. One thing which arguably helped out the Normans and made them more organized than their French counterparts is that they conquered a foreign land and got to design and impose a government. Well, William the Conqueror, in addition to his military skill, was also a skilled administrator. And one thing that he wanted to make sure of was that he was raising taxes um, according to the resources of his realm. So he wanted to make sure that he was getting the most out of his realm and that he was um, doing so efficiently. So 20 years in, in 1086, William ordered a survey of Anglo-Saxon tax obligations as they had stood under Edward the Confessor. Now obviously things had changed after the Norman Conquest and after he had reallocated so much land, 
But still, it was good to sort of get a sense for what the English had been doing before the Norman Conquest. And this leads to the Domesday Book, one of the most comprehensive books on administration and the details of governing compiled during that period. And actually, it would stand as one of the most detailed for quite a while. And it ends up being a thorough examination of the entire English realm. And what this also shows is the ambition of Norman governance and the dedication of the crown to being able to control local affairs, and also the importance, the central importance of information gathering for government. And that will again crop up when we talk about the rise of universities and the Renaissance in my next video. What were the Normans doing with all of this revenue that they were raising? Well, mostly they were waging war. In 1169, the Normans launched an invasion of Ireland, and this would lead to an ongoing generational conflict which would last all, for centuries. Um, the, the high tide for the Normans was reached in about 1300. However, the native Gaelic Irish continued to fight on for centuries. And the English conquest of Ireland would not really be completed until the time of Oliver Cromwell following the English Civil War in the 17th century one of, if not the, darkest stains on Cromwell and arguably on England as well, although there are quite a few uh, other incidents in English history which provide some pretty stiff competition, but we'll ignore that for now. Um, the main takeaway from this is that the Normans now had the ability to wage prolonged war and they also were raising revenue on a fairly regular basis. So the efforts undertaken by William and his successors to really systematize the administration of England were effective. Um, this also meant that um, the Normans were a threat to any and all of their neighbors because they had a much more efficient government than they did. So let's go back to France. Now France's administration had fallen behind the innovative Normans. And prior to Philip II and Augustus coming to power in 1180, um, the French realm was not really all that well run in comparative terms. The crown was only really represented by Provost outside of the Ile de France, which is the area that the king controlled directly, basically Paris. Um, and the problem with the Provost is that they were often corrupt and usually ineffective, and part of that is because they were much less powerful and influential than the lords that they were supposed to try to keep in line to some extent. Um, and because of this, and for some other reasons, the French kings were heavily dependent upon the cooperation of their nobles. Um, there really wasn't a strong central government like there was in England at this time. The great reformer in French medieval history was Philip II Augustus. And normally you do not earn the nickname Augustus unless you were truly great, and that Philip was. Philip ruled from 1180 to uh, 1223, and one of his main accomplishments was simply recognizing that the Norman system was superior to his own and copying it. So what he did is he set up bailiffs throughout France to replace the old and effective provost. In the south, these bailiffs had a different title. They were called something like Senecals, but same basic thing. And to make sure that these bailiffs were effective in his much larger and more widely spread realm, he added investigators who could go and then send reports to the crown about how well the bailiffs were actually trying to regulate the nobles and trying to enforce the king's writ. And with this network of royal officials in place, Philip now could actually intervene in most of the affairs of his kingdom and govern effectively in a way which is more than nominal. So at this point, we see that France is moving in a different direction than, say, the Holy Roman Empire, which is moving in the opposite direction, or at least it really starts to move hard in the opposite direction after 1250 or so. Despite the fact that Philip had copied Normandy's administration, he seems fairly cognizant of the fact that the primary threat to his power in the long run is England, which also is his biggest vassal by virtue of their role as the Dukes of Normandy and as holders of so much other land in his realm. So, although he will cooperate with England in the Third Crusade 
Um, it, most of Philip's career is actually dedicated to expanding his personal control in France at the expense of the English. So, his first move before going on the Third Crusade was to help Richard the Lionheart kill his father, Henry II. And uh, it's pretty cold when you consider that the previous picture that I showed you is Philip's inauguration, or not inauguration, but coronation, and that the gentleman with the red robes and crown who was there to congratulate him was Henry II. And then uh, he got back from the Crusade before Richard, and he decided to help Richard's brother John fight against Richard. And later, when John was established, um, there was a nephew of John's named Arthur, and Philip decided to give him money and try to help him claim the realm of Normandy. And in the end, he was successful at dividing and weakening the English, and he managed to take Normandy altogether. And not only that, but he took most of the holdings of England away, except for the holdings in the Aquitaine and the Channel Islands. And this was through a deft combination of military action, diplomacy, and playing feudal politics very, very effectively. So um, this was another of Philip's great achievements, and when he died, France was left greatly stronger whereas England's position and ability to intervene in French affairs had been reduced pretty dramatically. One of the most controversial legacies of the Middle Ages is the use of the Inquisition to root out heresy by force. Um, there are a lot of witch trials and other things which really gave the Inquisition a bad name. It also practiced torture. However, in this video, I want to focus not on its adherence to um, religious orthodoxy or anything like that, but I want to focus on the Inquisition as a tool of state as, and look at how Philip II used it. So the Inquisition actually dated back to about 1140 or so, and it originated as something that was there to investigate the Cathars of southern France. It was then revitalized in the 1170s to look at a similar group in Italy. And then Philip II decided to revive and expand the Inquisition in France, and that is the origin of the Albigensian Crusade, where, you know, in the name of defending Christ and orthodoxy, the um, you know Catholic Church declared war on southern France, and Philip and his family were able to go in and seize land pretty willy-nilly. Now, they did eliminate the Cathars, but in the process, one of the main results, if you're Philip and his immediate successors who really reap the benefits of this, is that you strengthen the crown's control over southern France pretty dramatically. You also added crown lands, and you were able to reward a lot of followers. In addition, you did crush a people who had a somewhat separate identity. So, it was a great success for Philip II, and it's a fairly, you know, fitting thing that someone who was as clever of a politician as Philip was able to see the potential of the Inquisition at, to, for advancing his secular wants. However, um, as is always the case, whenever there is a thing that's happening where the popes can claim some sort of authority or try to grasp power, this is exactly what the pope does. So in 1231, Pope Gregory IX got involved in Inquisitions and he declared that um, the papacy should regulate inquisitions, you know, set all the standards, appoint the inquisitors, and do all that kind of stuff. And that um, changed the nature of the inquisition. Um, and it also, he wanted to try to use this as a way to try to, uh, you know, in the name of rooting out heresy, try to impose his will on different realms. But, you know, ultimately most of these inquisitions were... Uh, more national, or at least partly national and then partly papal, and it was sort of a tug of war for authority um, going forward for the next few centuries. And in addition, um, whatever you read about any one inquisition might not actually be true of all of them. So like I said, these things started around 1140, and they ran all the way into the 16th century at least. And over that time, the methods for having trials, what you had to do to be qualified as an inquisitor, um, the way that they kept records, um, you know, the things that you could be punished for, all those things changed over time. So, um, you know, it, the Inquisition is actually a broad subject, and that's 
part of why I haven't talked about it in detail because it would be very easy to misspeak and oversimplify this actually fairly detailed and um, complex phenomenon. If you're familiar with the way that people treat great generals, there's a tendency to make sure that you give lots of credit to the generals who won these great victories without necessarily sometimes considering the people that they beat and how inept some of those people were. In the case of Philip II, a lot of his greatness was due to the fact that he really beat up on two of the dumbest kings in English history, Richard the Lionheart and John Softsword, or Landless, or whatever nickname you prefer for him. Anyway, um, John the First of England is one of the worst politicians in history, and when Philip II defeated him and kicked him out of Normandy, this created outrage among his nobles, many of whom had holdings in Normandy, and were absolutely furious that John had lost this major war. So, in order to take advantage of the situation and try to punish John to some extent, they forced him in 1215 to sign the Magna Carta. Now, all this translates to as the Great Charter. And all this is, is a document which confirms the privileges of the various barons, and mostly the reason that they want these privileges is to have it in writing, so that way they can refer to it over and over. And they also really want to protect themselves from being taxed by John, because John was notoriously autocratic, and he was always looking for ways to raise money to fight wars they didn't know how to win. So for them, this was a defensive measure, but it was also predatory because John was weak. Now, as soon as the ink was dry and John had recovered a bit, he decided to break this deal immediately, and he wanted to fight his barons. This led to the first barons' war from 1215 to 1217. However, John died in the middle of it, and then his young son, Henry III, confirmed the Magna Carta, and everything was fine for a while. But then, around 1258, Henry III was overthrown, and uh, there was a civil war. So when Henry and his son, Prince Edward, restored uh, the crown, they made an agreement that um, they would have a parliament, and this thing would be composed of the barons, and that it would meet three times a year. It could act like a large council for the king, like a full council, and as a court of justice. And it would also be attended by the bourgeois of the largest cities and towns like London. And if you really want to look into the Magna Carta as being one of the documents which founds democracy, there's not much to see. Um, now, the Magna Carta is often cited and referenced by people who talk about the evolution of the English model of liberty or of um, the origins of American democracy or whatever. But in reality, the Magna Carta was nothing more than a bunch of nobles getting together and confirming their privileges. And that's it. There was no mention of the common person and their personal rights. Nothing like that. There's no mention of representation for every citizen. Um, the only people who wanted to be represented were people who were already represented and wanted to be represented more, namely the nobles. Um, so almost every reference to the Magna Carta and any kind of modern political discourse is completely and totally uninformed and misleading. Uh, that being said, um, let's also look at what some of these privileges are. One of the privileges which the nobles claimed and would continue to claim for centuries is that if they were on a fox hunt or other hunt and that hunt happened to lead them through the lands of a peasant, that they were not liable for any damages that they might inflict on that peasant's land while they're chasing a wild animal and shooting a gun or a bow or whatever. So, again, not the most democratic document. And the people behind it are all aristocrats who don't care at all about peasants or common people and their rights. So, again, I hope that's been clear enough. The Magna Carta is not some sort of precursor to the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution in any but the most vague and meaningless way. Interestingly enough, at the same time that England developed a parliament, there was also a parlement in France, which was more or less the same thing. And this really occurs mostly under the reign of Philip IV the Fair, 
Now, Philip had two councils similar to what the English king had, but we know more about Philip's. He had a narrow council, which is the one that he would meet with all the time. And this was basically a council of university-educated nobles and other people who had lots of knowledge who would help him run his government and give him advice. And then he had a full council that he would meet with on more special occasions, parlement, and that comes from a French word which means something like to talk or parler. Um, parler is in just negotiate, not um, parler is in something dealing with pirate law. Anyway, um, this full council would include the other major lords, clerics, the town leaders, people he might not see very often and may not have ever met before that meeting. Um, now, Philip the Fair, I don't know how he got that name. I assume it's for something that he did in earlier in the middle of his reign, but he ended his reign by creating a great stir among his noble supporters because he raised a massive amount of taxes and he was going to spend those taxes waging a war to reclaim the Low Countries. But then he made peace and uh, kept the money and never raised an army or went on campaign. So the nobles were furious and then Philip died and left those problems to his son Louis X. And that meant that Louis X needed to make peace with the nobles who were all outraged. And he made that peace in the form of making major concessions to them. And what is known as the Charter of Louis X, what happens is that Louis confirms the various noble liberties but he retained a lot of really important stuff. The right to call for military service, meaning he can also declare war. Um, he can also um, allow nobles to pay their way out of service, so instead of serving in person, you can pay the equivalent that the king will need to hire someone to replace you. And uh, the reason why he was able to do that is because he was able to confirm that he has the right to tax and military service was seen as a kind of tax um, in that time and place. So basically, Louis didn't really give up all that much, but at the same time, he did confirm that um, the nobles in France needed to be consulted and that they had a right to um, attend the councils of state. And it's been sort of a more informal thing under Philip, and the only real difference is under Louis now you have this become formalized. The first English efforts to subdue the Scots had occurred as far back as about 1072, and they had been in the process of trying to conquer Ireland since about 1170 or so. So you might be surprised to learn that it wasn't until 1277 when the English actually conquered Wales. Now why there was this delay, I actually don't know. I assume there's an answer, but I don't have it. Now, Edward I is the ruler who pulled this off, and it took him about six or so years to do it, from 1277 to 1283. And when he took it over, he divided the territory between native principalities, so he appeased some of the major local lords, and then he created some fiefs for his own followers, so similar to what William had done when he took over England itself. And as a fief, this area would be inherited by the English crown, so this is the origin of the idea of the having the title Prince of Wales attached to the title of King of England. Um, that is where that comes from, because the king kind of ruled it independently of his other powers, but also it was part of being King of England as you get to be Prince of Wales. It's kind of one of those weird arrangements that only makes sense if you pretend to understand feudalism. Um, and this is another interesting thing financially and from a state perspective because um, the war and occupation in Wales incurred a lot of unexpected expenses. And this meant that the kings needed to raise money and to raise enough money to keep these war efforts up, they had to turn to Parliament for help in raising taxes. So this would be something that would um, contribute to the continuing role and importance of Parliament. And um, Edward I, as you might remember, is someone who was important in uh, setting up the initial parliaments back in 1260 or so. So um, it kind of makes sense that he'd be one of the first to have to really rely on parliament for a major venture. Before we move forward with our historical narrative, I'd also like to touch on a few other people who were important 
for the formation and furtherance of the state in both France and England. Louis IX of France is mostly known as a crusader, but one of the other important things that he did was to um, extend the royal writ into towns by incorporating towns in the Parlement. And that is important because then that gives the members of these towns a sense of having a connection with the king and really being a part of his um, command structure. Edward I of England, um, he, the conqueror of Wales, he also uh, was important for Parliament. And he also passed a lot of laws which helped to systematize government in other ways. Philip the Fair, I assume fair in this case could probably refer to his looks, but it could just be that they thought he was a, a fair person. Probably his looks, though. Um, he was the guy who really came up with the Gens de Roy, the King's Men. Uh, these are people who are university trained, often lower nobility or bourgeois, and they were basically his brain trust, his sort of what we'd call today like his cabinet, his administration. And, uh, you know, so they were important for guiding his decisions. And then his son, Louis X, is the guy who passed the charter to confirm the liberties of nobles, but was adept enough to prevent himself from giving up any major powers that he would actually need to govern effectively. So now let's look at the Hundred Years' War. So let's now shift our focus for the remainder of this video to the Hundred Years' War. And what this was, was a series of three or more separate conflicts which have been lumped together by historians to describe the general state of affairs existing between France and England during this period. And if you were going strictly by the dates, it would really be 115 years. Although, I think you still end up with less than 100 years if you actually count the years that they were at war. Um, I, I say, think there was one pause of almost 15 years at one point, but at any rate. Let's not worry about those little details. Um, so the immediate cause is that Edward III of England had some grievances with Philip VI of France. Um, Philip had pledged to restore some land that had been taken at Guienne. He hadn't done it. And um, Philip had also supported the Scots at some point, and that really miffed uh, Edward III. And also, Edward had an ambition to take Flanders with its important markets. So those are the sort of immediate causes of the outbreak. But what really kept it going, and what sort of made it inevitable at some point, was a dynastic dispute over the throne created by feudalism, namely that old relationship between the Duke of Normandy and his suzerain, the King of France. Um, and also by dynastic marriages, which meant that pretty much anyone at a certain point could claim enough kinship to claim an entitlement to an inherited throne or office. So basically, in a word, feudalism caused the Hundred Years War. Let's take a brief view at the opposing sides and what they brought to the table militarily. So England had evolved the system with combined arms and professional regiments. They had a lot of experience fighting the Scots and really utilizing infantry formations more effectively than the French had been doing. The French army, by contrast, had a lot more knights, and they based their army around the supremacy of their knights and their ability to launch overwhelming charges. Um, so they had less emphasis on their infantry. And the English infantry, by the way, included men who had weapons to fight knights on foot, and it included the famous longbows, which gave them great range and the ability to reach out and hit their opponents from a distance. And both sides, uh, on various times, would supplement their ranks by hiring mercenaries. The French most famously hired lots of Italian crossbowmen to try to offset the English longbowmen, but for the most part, that was not all that effective. Now, there are some X factors in this war, and these things will have... Um, an impact at various times. One is the allegiance of French vassals to the French king. Will they show up to fight for France? Will they stay their hand? Or will they even defect to the king of England? And the most important of all these vassals is the Duke of Burgundy in the southeast. He often will break away from France and deprive France of one of its strongest regions, sometimes even lending his forces to the English. Um, so 
uh, Duke of Burgundy is a major problem for the French. Also, he is the official responsible later for uh, turning in Joan of Arc, at any rate. Um, another X factor is the military skill of the opposing kings. Um, very few of the French kings during this war will be competent generals, whereas most of the English kings will be quite good. Um, so despite the fact that they have the blood of John flowing through their veins, they will um, have military ability. And Scotland is sort of the Burgundy of the English. Um, it is an area which can revolt and which can actually pose a threat to Northern England. So this will be something that the English will have to be weary of since France and Scotland had developed a kind of uh, relationship where they would combine to keep the English in check by attacking on each front and forcing the English to stop their aggression. The Hundred Years' War was almost as complicated as it is long in terms of how many changes of fortune there were, how many important battles were fought, and all that. So I'll try to be brief and general. Um, so one of the major tactics employed during the war was launching massive raids where you would take quick strike forces and cut a swath through the enemy's territory. And most years of the war, that was what happened. You had one or both armies in the field doing that, and a lot of times the two armies would never meet. Um, there also were treaties at various times during the periods of peace, which were very short-lived, where a lot of the treaty would involve, okay, if you trade me your stuff in the north, I'll give you stuff in the west. Um, so a lot of the treaties will involve um, no one really winning. They'll just involve people trading assets. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the French were generally stronger because France is a more productive country than England in terms of its agricultural yield, um, and it has a bigger population. Um, of course, also England is on the offensive, and they have to support their troops uh, over the channel, so they have a disadvantage there. However, the English, um, because they had a more efficient and well-developed army, were better able to win major battles and they could exploit those major battles. But in between the major battles, it was usually the French who were slowly regaining um, the upper hand and making progress. And then a major battle would occur, the English would win, and uh, you know the process would start all over again. So it's a little bit like the uh, Rock of Sisyphus in a way. Anyway... Um, there also were outside events which would really impact the course of the war. Early in the war, the Black Death broke out. That obviously inhibited the ability of both powers to field armies and raise revenue and all that. The English had a better administration, so they recovered faster. That ended up helping them, at least in relative terms. I doubt they would have seen it that way at the time, given how many people died from the Black Death. Um, there were also events back in England, like the revolt of Owain Glendore in 1400, as well as some previous Welsh revolts, and these could impact the course of the war by forcing England to focus on dealing with those problems rather than dealing with the French. Um, they had kind of factored in the Scottish problem um, as part of their overall strategy, so that wasn't as much of a surprise as some of these Welsh revolts and stuff like that. And of course, uh, the French themselves could face revolts like the Jackery Revolt. Um, so, you know, there were lots of things which could affect how prepared and how focused each side was. Um, and for the most part, things will go kind of back and forth to some extent. Uh, the English will be at their best around 12, the late uh, 1420s, and then from then on, there's constant progress by the French. Um, and before that, the English were dominating, more or less. So, now let's look at some major battles. The first major battle of the Hundred Years' War was actually a naval battle at Sluis. And what happened here is that the two fleets collided in the channel, and the English Navy emerged in total victory, basically putting the entire French fleet on the bottom and taking out a lot of sailors. So, you might think that that would ensure English naval supremacy for a long time. But it actually really didn't, because what the English King Edward III then did was focus his navy on building merchant ships. And then that ruined part of the English economy for private merchants, and at the same time ruined the English fleet because he decommissioned most of his warships. 
So when the French started floating boats again, they weren't opposed as much. So it was as if the English had lost that battle because of the decisions that they made after it. Um, there also were two major land battles early in the war. One was at Creasy, commanded by Edward III in person. The other one was at Poitiers, commanded by Edward's son, the Black Prince. In both cases, the English were victorious, and what happened is the English used their smaller but better army to defeat a much larger French force, which just kind of played into their hands by attacking them head-on and allowing the longbow to operate to full effect. Um, so those were two major English victories, and it basically showed the ability of the English to win major battles. Um, the same thing surprisingly happened 60 years later at Agincourt. So what had happened is um, there was a large English raid under the current king, and he had died. And then there was also a small plague outbreak. So the English army was reduced to a relatively small handful and now um, Henry V had basically come to power. He was the crown prince out on campaign. And his army was weakened and demoralized. And they were trying to get back to port to leave. And then the French pursued them confidently and decided to corner them and destroy them. So Henry took up position on top of a hill. And then the French tried to charge uphill in the mud with their knights. But then those guys got stuck in the mud, two whole waves of them, and then Henry's longbows just rained down on them, and then he counterattacked, and the third part of the French army actually just kind of left. Um, and this was bad for uh, the French. They lost three dukes, a bunch of counts, all kinds of heirs to different noble titles, and that would have been bad enough, but what it really did was just really demoralize and delegitimize the French king and his uh, leadership, and that led to another major Burgundian revolt. So Henry V had retreated, and he probably felt like he'd escaped by the skin of his teeth, and then when he returned 18 months later with a new army, he found that the French were actually in much worse shape than they had been right after the battle he had won. So uh, that was an unexpected boon, and of course the guy pictured here is Henry V, um, however, things started to change not too long after that. At the Siege of Orléans, uh, the English were on the verge of winning the entire war. Orléans was really the last major French city, and the English had been laying siege to it for a while. And then a relief army of Frenchmen appears with Joan of Arc, who's waving a banner and claiming to be inspired by God. And then the French manage to sally out and defeat the English siege, and then they go on the offensive from there. Later on, in the 1450s, the French are entirely on the offensive, and they are doing really well. So at Formigny in 1450, the French boot the English out of Normandy forever. And then at Castilian uh, in 1453, the French conquer Gascony, which is that area of the Basque that we talked about in my video on uh, medieval Iberia. So... Um, that basically ended the war for all practical intents and purposes. Um, technically, the war wouldn't end for another 20 years, but there were no real battles fought after this point. So that's why 1453 is the sort of official end date that historians recognize for the Hundred Years' War. Let's talk about the role of Joan of Arc in the Hundred Years' War. Now, Joan was born in 1412 in northeastern France, it's not really clear what her social background was. She could have been a member of the minor bourgeois. Um, some people claim her as a peasant, but most likely it looks like her father was a minor official in town. She may have had some very elementary education. Um, we don't really know for sure. We do know is that by the time she got to her early to mid-teens, she had been having visions where God had told her to liberate France from the evil English. And she began to talk about the vision she was having, and people started to believe her. So she is the one who helps to rally an army to try to relieve Orléans. And she's there when they win a key battle. She helps to inspire them because they believe that she is sent by God, and that they have a divine mission, a kind of crusade to drive out the English. Um, so after she helps win this crucial battle at Orléans, she helps Charles VII traveled through hostile territory to go to Reims and be crowned. That's a you know an act of symbolic importance for sure. Um, now 
Chances are, she knew basically nothing about military affairs. After all, she was like a 17-year-old girl who, uh, you know, wouldn't have had access to like a rich court life or any kind of uh, education that would have involved her reading um, the military classics or anything like that. So most likely what she was doing is out there really serving as kind of a mascot and a rallying cry, since in the eyes of her countrymen she represented... Um, you know, someone who was chosen by God to help them liberate their country. And by this point, the French really did have a stronger national identity because the English, with their devastating raids and other practices, had thoroughly alienated the French people. Now, the Burgundians, again, uh, were basically there to hurt France. <laughs> so, uh, the Duke of Burgundy actually captured Joan of Arc. He later would crusade at Varna. Um, anyway, he um, captured Joan and handed her over to the English. And then she was executed for heresy and cross-dressing by the English in 1431. Pretty obvious example of a politically motivated Inquisition. And, uh, you know, so Joan's life ended at the age of 19. But even at that young age, she had already become the most famous woman in the entirety of medieval history. And um, the victories that she set in motion would then gain momentum and lead to the eventual French victory at the end of the war, about 20 years or so after she died. So to revisit all of the themes and concepts that I talked about earlier, what are the ultimate consequences of the Hundred Years' War? Well, one thing that goes along with having a more organized state is that militaries tend to become more professionalized. After all, they have a lot more funding now due to a regular tax base, and it becomes customary to have a standing army. So both armies will emerge more professionalized. The English army will perfect what it was already working on, and then the French army will realize that while they do have the best knights in Europe, you have to incorporate infantry more effectively, and you can't just allow knights to charge whenever they feel their blood boiling um, as happened at some of the major battles where the knights got themselves beaten thoroughly. Um, we also see that national identities were very strongly created in this war. Um, by the end of the war, the English and the French saw themselves as not only different from one another and fully distinguishable, but also as enemies. And they would continue to be enemies, or at least antagonistic on a lot of levels until about World War I, actually. Um, the English will always think that they have a duty to stop the French ogre, and um, some English historians who write in purple prose compare their role in fighting Napoleon's empire to their role in fighting Hitler. Um, so there's this sort of um, really over-the-top rhetoric that they would use about each other. Um, now, the peace will only become official in 1475, uh, which is weird, but that's how it happened. And a lot of that is because England didn't have time to make the peace formal because they were wrapped up in their own dynastic instability, which, mercifully for them, the French didn't try to exploit too much because the French also had to deal with Burgundy, which was still a problem. Um, so the English are fighting the War of the Roses by 1455, and once they managed to emerge from that and make peace with France, the French then uh, moved to crush Burgundy and remove it from existence. Um, by this point, the feudal system is disintegrating as well. Um, partly, this is due to broader socioeconomic trends like the growth of towns and trade and um, population growth. Well, population hadn't really been growing that much because of the Black Death. It'll start growing again um, at the end of this century. And partly because war became democratized in the Hundred Years' War. An English longbowman from some part of rural England has a role to play on the battlefield. And that person is valuable, just like a knight. Um, maybe not as valuable in the eyes of the elites, but someone who still has you know, a lot of utility. They're not expendable anymore. Um, your crossbowmen in France, they're not expendable your um, regular infantrymen. And this sort of um, placing of value on them, despite their social status, but placing a value on them for their economic and military contributions 
that really helps to try that's to at least start to dissolve the bounds of feudalism and uh, move both countries toward what would become mercantilism as a system of economics. And uh, the English, as you see on this map, have a little spot of red in France, and that is Calais. And they will hold on to that all the way until 1558. And that's something that they actually only required during the war, and they took it the year after they won the Battle of Crecy. Um, and that's a slightly isolated part of France. Um, and Calais, that's part of the reason why Hitler thought that... Um, the Allies would land at Calais rather than Normandy because they thought that Calais held this great significance to the English, um, and that you know they were determined to retake it because it was their last holding in France. But anyway, um, as with so many other things, Hitler was wrong and delusional. So anyway, uh, we'll end it there. I don't know how I ended this video with a Hitler reference. I try not to do that, but okay, it happened. So we'll live with it. All right. Next time, we're talking about the Renaissance. Completely different topic, similar time period.